Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Beautiful day in Long Branch. Great summer at the Jersey Shore this summer. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to what we've got to talk about. But um, first off, we have like the National Lifeguarding Champions here. Is that right? Where are you? Chris, get over here. All right. Congratulations. Good work. Representing New Jersey. Oh, I get a sweatshirt? I didn't do anything. No, I get something. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'll take it right up here. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. That's great. Thank you. It's a great thing about being governor. I didn't do anything. I get the sweatshirt. I get the sweatpants. It's great. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming today. A few things to... Um, talk about and then I'll turn it over to you to ask questions of me about whatever is on your mind. Um, first thing is um, I was in um, I was in Ocean City last week and you know we have a lot of concern um, especially in that part of the Jersey Shore and probably in this part too um, about what's happening in Atlantic City. Uh, we have some casinos that are planning to close down so folks who, you know, having the jobs threatened, and that's a real concern to me and concern to a lot of people in New Jersey. Um, we're getting together and trying to figure out what we can do to help. Um, and we've been working on Atlantic City for the last four years. And all the non-gaming things that are going on in Atlantic City are going much better um, than they've been going at any time in Atlantic City's history. And remember, Atlantic City was built in a time when we were a monopoly. Now, only Nevada and New Jersey had gambling. Uh, and we wound up building a lot of casinos in Atlantic City that was built for capacity where it was just us or Nevada or overseas where you could go to gamble. Now, of course, over the last uh, 35 years or so, uh, we've had 38 other states join us in casino gambling. And so when that competition comes, there's lots of different people who came from all over the country uh, to come to Atlantic City to gamble we're now gambling in places that are much closer to home. So the downsizing of Atlantic City is gonna be a natural thing that's gonna happen when you're built for a monopoly and you no longer are a monopoly. What we wanna to try to do is to make sure that all that stuff happens in a way that lessens the disruption to the people's lives in that portion of our state as much as possible and the economic upset that it causes as well. So I'm gonna have a summit of all the, the folks who are involved, government officials, private sector owners, other than of all the different hotels and casinos in Atlantic City and the other economic interests in Atlantic City on September 8th. We're going to talk about a plan to help those folks who may lose their jobs going forward and also try to see how we turn things around a little bit down there. We, we can't look at this as a disaster. It's not a disaster. What it is, is a time for us to take an opportunity to uh, change the way Atlantic City operates and to make sure that it grows in the right direction as a resort town, which is what it's always been. Um, through its entire history, and we're going to need to work on that. And I want you to know that we're working on it, and that I'm thinking about it, and working with other people who are stakeholders um, in Atlantic City and in our economy across New Jersey. Um, second thing I'll talk to you about today is the, the fiscal future of the state. Um, you know, lots of things that we've done over the course of the last nearly five years now um, that have made the state more stable fiscally. For instance, today in the budget that we have right now, we spend less money today in fiscal year 15, which started on July 1st, than we did in fiscal year 08, seven years ago. That's not less based on projection. That's actual dollars less in fiscal year 15 than we sent, spent in fiscal year 08. Um, we have 6,000 fewer state employees today than we had the day I took the oath of office in January of 2010. We've downsized government, we've made it smaller, we're spending less than we've spent um, in the last seven years. And so all those things are good things in terms of the long-term fiscal health of the state. Uh, we also passed pension and benefit reform in 2011, which we needed to begin to do. Um, and we have a higher retirement age now than we had before. We have uh, employees paying more into the pension than they did before. We have more penalties for early retirement than we had before. Um, we have things that make sense. We eliminated cost of living adjustments because these pension funds were significantly low on money. Um, in fact, it was a $57 billion problem 
when we got into office in 2010. Now, the good news is that through those reforms, we've cut $17 billion off of that deficit. The bad news is there's still a $40 billion deficit in the pension fund. And so while the progress that we made and we'll save over the course of the next 30 years just through those reforms, $120 billion, but we still have a $40 billion problem to fix. In addition, our public health insurance plan is got a $47 billion deficit. Even though now, when I first came into office, public sector workers, many of them, in fact, most of them paid nothing for their health insurance. No payments worth their premium at all. The taxpayers paid 100% of the premiums. Now we have a sliding scale where depending upon how much you make, the more you make, the more you pay. But still, the Pew Research Center came out with a study just last week where they said New Jersey's health insurance for, that we give to our public sector workers are the third richest health benefits in the country, number three out of 50, and that we pay significantly less of a percentage, meaning the employees pay significantly less a percentage even after the reforms than the average across the country. If you look at the numbers themselves, the delta, the difference between what private sector employers both pay for their health insurance for their employees and what those employees contribute to their health insurance versus the same comparison with public sector workers is the taxpayers pay $10,000 more per year per employee for public employees health insurance than the very same people in the private sector. So this is a situation that just can't go on. The last fact that I'll tell you is that next year for the first time in New Jersey history, we will pay more for retirees' health benefits, public sector retirees' health benefits, than we'll pay for all of our active employees. So we're paying more now, next year, for people who have retired than we will for all of the people across all of government that are actually working still for their health insurance. If you just listen to those facts, the inescapable conclusion is that we have to do something. And if you don't think we have to do something, if you think, well, listen, I was promised this and I'm going to get it, I'm entitled to it, and that's that, um, just look at the city of Detroit. I'm sure all of you read that in the last six months or so, the city of Detroit went bankrupt. And they went bankrupt because they had $2 billion in cash in Detroit and $11 billion in debt. And of that $11 billion in debt, $9.5 billion of it was retiree pension and retiree health care. The same way pensions and retiree health care and health care costs brought down General Motors and the automobile industry, it brought down the city of Detroit. The same way they, had, they went bankrupt to get out of it, Detroit has now gone bankrupt to get out of it. I don't want New Jersey to go bankrupt. I don't want New Jersey to have to face those kind of choices. And so we need to face these choices now. And they're not easy choices and they're not pleasant ones to have to make. But the fact is that for those who will tell you that all we have to do is just continue to pay into the pension and everything will be fine, understand this, that for us to make the actuarially required pension payment over the next four years, we're gonna to have to raise taxes in New Jersey beyond where they are now by $4 billion annually. Now, we're already the second highest tax state in America. That will clearly make us number one, and it will make this state completely unaffordable for many of its citizens, and it will make it even more unattractive for businesses, which will create our ability, or will, which will impact our ability to create jobs. This is all common sense stuff. Like, I'm not up here splitting the atom. You, know, you all understand. You deal with it in your own home. You have expenses, you have revenue government, at home, you have expenses and you have income. And if the income's not matching the expenses, you either gotta go out and get yourself more income or you gotta cut your expenses. We have a constitutional requirement to balance the budget in this state. We're not like Washington, we can't run a deficit. And the fact is that over the years, remember, it was only, only 36 years ago that New Jersey didn't have any income tax at all. And you remember that 36 years ago, the income tax was created saying, it's just going to be a small income tax, 
two percent and it'll only go for property tax relief so we're going to take that money and we're going to use it to lower your property taxes how'd that work out whenever government says you're going to take money out of your right pocket but don't worry i'm going to put more back in your left pocket they always take the money out of the right and the money doesn't always get into the left and that's what's happened here over the course of time and, and so the fact is we have to do things differently we can't raise taxes in the state we can't make it more expensive and there'll be some folks who'll say to you well listen just raise taxes on the rich people because most people aren't rich so you know raise taxes on them well remember this our top tax rate's already nine percent which is the third highest in america remember too that the top one percent of taxpayers in this state the top one percent we have about four million taxpayers in our state so the four, top 40,000 taxpayers pay 41 percent of the income tax so out of four million folks paying income tax in the state by the way that's out of nearly nine million people who live here only four million pay income tax but of the four million who do well, 40,000 pays 41 percent of the entire income tax but it gets even worse the top 10 individual taxpayers in this state pay more than the bottom 2 million taxpayers so if those 10 individuals leave the state they pay more in income tax into the state than the bottom 2 million taxpayers imagine what you'd have to do to replace that revenue and who you'd have to raise taxes on so be very careful about the argument just raise it on the other people because if those other people leave we got to make up the money somehow and then we're coming after you that's invariable it will happen and you know it's happened before in 2003 and 2004 when we doubled the income tax in this state and it's and, and creating a millionaire's tax this is great by the way we have a millionaire's tax in new jersey and it applies to everybody making four hundred thousand dollars a year or more but we call it a millionaire's tax it's called like new jersey definitions and when i go around the country and talk to people i say listen come to new jersey if you're not a millionaire don't worry about it we'll make you feel like one we'll tax you like one even if you make four hundred thousand dollars a year when we doubled those income taxes in those years the first couple of years of governor mcgreevy boston college did a study from 2004 to 2008 after those income tax increases went in effect in 02 and 03 70 billion dollars in wealth left this state that's not diminished wealth that's departed wealth they left to go someplace else remember too they don't have to leave completely they can have a great place in long branch for 180 days a year if they spend 185 days a year in florida they're a florida resident they pay no income tax or 185 days a year in tennessee with no income tax they pay no income tax or in delaware no income tax there's plenty of places for them to go and they don't have to go the whole time they can spend the whole summer at the jersey shore and not pay a nickel in new jersey income tax so don't let people tell you they won't leave they don't have to leave completely they just have to leave for 185 days they leave for 185 days they don't have to pay our income taxes here so these are the realities and i'll end with this i'd love to be a governor at a time when there was so much money coming into government that i could be just you know the happiest guy in the world just giving out money to every program that everybody likes and not having to have these conversations about pensions or health benefits i would love to be living in one of those times but i'm not and this is the job that i've got and the fact is that over the course of the next three years that i have left as governor i could paper this over now i don't have to talk about it believe me i'm pretty good at this i could wallpaper it over people wouldn't really know what was going on then the next governor would come in he or she would tear the wallpaper off the wall and go oh my god look what's under here and then everybody would be stuck with the bill then that'd be the easiest thing for me to do politically i'm not going to do that you hired me to do a job and to tell you the truth as I see it. And there'll be plenty of people who argue and disagree with me, and that's fine. That's what this country's all about. But in the end, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And these are the facts. 
And so we need to get to work. And that's what I'm talking about this summer, and I'll be talking about it into the fall. And in the fall, I'll put forward some proposals. I put together a commission of nine people. You know, three, four Republicans, four Democrats, and an independent. No politicians among them. All experts in money management, pension funds, uh, all of that as their experience. And I told them to come back to me and define what the problem is, make sure we get independent confirmation of the facts, and then give me some ideas about what you think we should do. And then this fall, when they come back with the report, we'll have the conversation about what to do, and we'll see if the legislature's willing to work with me to do something or not. I hope they are. Because if they're not, someone's gonna be governor after me. And that man or woman is gonna have an enormous, ugly problem on their hands. And one that in the end, I fear, will only be solved at that point by them going into your pockets. And that's not the way to do this, I don't think. So those are the things we're talking about this summer. A lot of joyous, upbeat stuff. Um, so now we'll get to the fun part of the program. You get to ask questions and I get to answer them. Um, there are only four rules for my town hall meetings. I think this is my 127th town hall meeting since I've been governor. Um, I love doing this. I love coming out and hearing directly from people about what's on their mind. So there's four rules. First rule is this. You raise your hand, I call on you. Don't yell out questions. I don't answer yell out questions. In fact, I'm very good at ignoring them. The reason I'm good at ignoring them is not because I'm governor. It's because I'm a father of four. Between 11 and 21. And all of you parents and grandparents out there know that you develop an acute skill to be able to actually zone that out. And now I apply it in my job as governor. Second rule is, when I call on you, please just wait till you get the microphone. There's folks from my staff will come around and get you a microphone so that everybody can hear you. We're outside, you hear the ocean behind us. I wanna make sure everybody can hear your question. I wanna make sure I can too. And if you'd be kind enough to tell me your name and where you're from so I can address you properly rather than saying, you know, hey, you in the, in the pink shirt, I'd rather do it that way. Third rule is not so much a rule as it is a bit of advice. When you get this microphone in your hand, you will feel an indescribable yet undeniable, gravitational-like pull to give a speech. It's okay, I'll listen to your speech for a while and that's fine. But at some point, you will hear me, I've come up with a subtle social cue to get you to your question. I will just start going, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. When you hear me doing that, you'll know, I get it, okay, you gotta get to your question because we have other people here who may wanna ask questions and I wanna give them a chance too. So I'll listen for a while, but at some point we need to get to the question and, and get to the answer. And the fourth is this, today we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven cameras here today. Um, what happens when these TV cameras come to folks sometimes is they look around, they see those TV cameras and say, this is it. This is my chance. I am going to be famous. Tonight, I am going to be on the news. My family, my friends will all see me on TV. It happens, believe me. And the easiest way for you to get on TV, I can guarantee you having done 126 of these, and this one being number 127, the easiest way is for you to take the governor of New Jersey out for a walk. I think you know what I mean. We're all from New Jersey. If you come here to give me a hard time today, that's fine. I'm happy to take it. That's part of the job. But I am also from New Jersey my whole life. And what that means is if you give it, you are getting it back the exact same way. So with those fair warnings, I am now ready to take questions from anybody who has them. Start right there. Yes, ma'am. He's coming right down this way. Governor. Hi. Uh, Tina Smith from Mendham, New Jersey. All right. I could have met you at the pub. You could have met me at home, yeah. I do see you sometimes. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, one is about the pharma industry and jobs and companies moving out of New Jersey and to Cambridge and other places, and I want you to talk that, about that, but it's more so about, I own a small business in Morristown. You can't get loans. Kill me with taxes. Can you speak about small business owners and what you think you can do to help us? Sure. Um, I'll start with the first one and go to the second one. The, the, the first one on pharma is that, you know, part of the problem you mentioned in both of your questions, right? It's the affordability inside New Jersey and whether you're a large business 
you know, like Johnson & Johnson, or whether you're a small business like yours in Morristown, you have to pay taxes. And when those taxes get so high that you begin to say to yourself, well, I can't really make money and make it worthwhile for me. It's a different amount of money for you than it is for Johnson & Johnson, but it's the same principle. That people just start to say, I'm not gonna create any more jobs and incur more costs. Or I'm gonna take these jobs, I'm gonna move them to a state where they tax me less so I can keep more of the money that I'm earning. And so the, the fact is with the pharma industry, now while most of pharma is still here, and we still have more of a pharma presence than anybody in the country, the fact is that they are leaving, a lot of them are leaving because of the tax situation. Now, we had Roach leave, that's the biggest one up in Nutley, um, and that's devastating for that town and for the folks who work there. One of the ways we're trying to combat that, I've been trying to argue to the legislature that we should lower taxes and they don't want to hear anything about it. In fact, um, in the last five years, I've vetoed income tax increases four times. So rather than even thinking about making your taxes more affordable, they just want to make them higher. Um, and they say to me all the time, you're wrong, Governor. People aren't going to leave and they're not going to close down their businesses. And that's why I wish some of these folks in the legislature on the Democratic side would come to these town hall meetings because I can't tell you how many town hall meetings out of 127, I bet you 100 of them, I've had a business owner like you raise the same kind of issue you just raised. And yet they say that it's all by imagination. It's not. Um, one of the ways we're trying to help with the farm industry, which I have already seen is helping, is the merger that we did between UMDNJ and Rutgers. Now all the medical schools, the nursing schools, the dental schools are all under Rutgers. It's now one-stop shopping for the pharmaceutical industry and the biomedical industry. And what that means is they work with universities and, and hospitals to do everything from the initial research in the laboratories with professors and others who are well-trained in this, all the way through the clinical trials that you have to do on people in the hospitals. In New Jersey, we made it more difficult on them because it was two stops. They did the research at Rutgers then they had to do the clinical trials at UMDNJ. And it meant two sets of paperwork, two sets of experts, two sets of expenses. And so a lot of them decided to just start doing it in Massachusetts, where the university system up there is very well coordinated and it's one-stop shopping. So we saw that and I pushed for two years for the merger of Rutgers and UMDNJ. We have that done now. And to show you what effect it's had, a positive effect it's had on the state and on those institutions, Rutgers has now gone from 55th in, in National in, uh, Health Institute grants to 22nd, just in the last two years. Uh, that means a lot more federal money coming in to create the new developments in, in the biomedical and medical field for tomorrow. That's gonna draw more talent here because the money is here. And the pharma companies, I just met with the executives at Johnson & Johnson two weeks ago at their offices, and they've already said that they're considering now doing many more of their clinical trials in New Jersey because they can just deal with Rutgers. And they're headquartered in New Brunswick. They can go over and meet with the Rutgers faculty and it's one set of forms and one set of grant agreements and they're done. So I think you're gonna see that help the pharma industry, keeping it here, maybe even growing some of the smaller biotech firms here because they have access to this national money that they didn't have before in New Jersey or it was much too complicated to get at it. As to your small business, listen, We've cut regulations on small, on small and, and medium-sized businesses over the last four and a half years by a third over where they were when the course on administration was here. That helps to keep your expenses a little bit lower. But in the end, this is an argument over taxes. And the question, the real philosophical divide is do you want a bigger government or a smaller one? Because if you want a smaller one, you're willing to deal with a smaller one, we can lower taxes. If you want government to continue to get bigger and bigger, well then you have to have tax money to pay for it. And there's only some places you can get it from. And that's the argument I've been having for five years with the legislature. Now I've won the argument on spending. We're spending a lot less and that's why for the first time in two decades, New Jersey's gone five years in a row without an income tax increase or a sales tax increase in the last five years. It's the first time in 20 years that that's happened. The only reason that's happened is because I'm spending less. If I were spending more, I'd have to raise taxes. So. This is the argument that everyone's gonna have and, and this pension and health insurance part plays a big piece of that. Think about this, in the last four years, 60 cents of every new dollar in revenue we've had from economic growth, 60 cents of every new dollar has gone to three things. Pension, public sector health care, both active and retiree, and debt service. All backwards looking things. 
that's money that we don't have to spend on education, K-12, to or higher education, on our hospitals and our healthcare system, on dealing with our developmentally disabled population, on trying to make sure that we keep our streets safe and have more police officers and firefighters. All those things are things that we can't spend that money on because we're spending on those three things. It's not sustainable. And for a small business person like you, it will crush you. It just will, no matter how hard you work. And so we need to continue to make this message clear, and I'm going to continue talking about it. And I will tell you this, as long as I'm here, we're not raising the income tax, we're not raising the sales tax. New Jerseyans are taxed too much already, and we'll just continue to cut spending. We're not going to raise taxes here. Other questions? Yes, sir, right in front. He's coming around. Hi, Governor. Hey. My name is Seth Kifak. I live in uh, South Brunswick. I'm retired, and my wife, she cannot find a job for almost a year and a half. And taxes going up and up and up. We cannot afford to live in, in the house anymore. Plus, I'm spending tons of money on prescription. I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, and what the governor can going to do. You, you said you no know, tax increase. But every year, our house is going up and up and up. Yeah. Second question, sure. yep. we'd like to see you in the White House soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, what I said was no income tax increase, no sales tax increase. Now on property taxes, they in the last four years have gone up less than they've gone up at any time in the last 24 years. They've gone up on average 1.7% a year over the last four years statewide. Now, that's because we put a property tax cap in effect of 2%. We put an interest arbitration cap in effect. We said that public sector raises could not be any more than 2% per year. So what we did was, remember, the 10 years before I became governor, property taxes went up 70% in 10 years, an average of 7% a year. We now have that average down over the last four years to 1.7%. So we took a train that was going 100 miles an hour. We slowed it down to about 25 miles an hour. Now, I know for you, given your situation and lots of other people, um, unless that train starts going backwards, it's not nearly the kind of help that you're looking for. Um, but we have slowed it down. The only way that we're going to push it back is if we deal with some of these inherent costs. We have too many towns. We have too many school boards. We have, you know, 565 municipalities in this small state of ours. And we have over 600 school boards. We have more school boards than we have towns, right? Every one of those places has a mayor and council, has a CFO and an administrator, has a public works director and a public health director and all kinds of other employees in the DPW. They all have their own police force and their own fire department and their own EMTs and they, they all have their own. And you know, I love when people talk to me about this because people say, you know what, Governor, you are absolutely right. We should start consolidating these towns, pushing them together, saving costs that way with lower property taxes would be great. You know, because it's so much waste going on in all those other towns. Not in my town, but all those other towns, there are awful things going on. See, I bought in my town because it's a special, unique place, and I wouldn't want to merge with my neighbor because it would just change the whole character of the place. But, you know, in all those other towns, you should get on those other people to start consolidating. We have this weird thing in New Jersey. We all like our own little town. Right? We bought in our own little town. We want to keep our own little town. We like the name. We like the post office. We like the whole thing. We want all that stuff. Well, all that stuff costs money. So I talk about my own towns, as people, you know, are suspicious of just talking about other people. And you know, I have a fellow men in residence. Are you the borough or the township? You're the township. I'm the township too. The township in Mendham Township in Morris County, it's shaped like a horseshoe. And there's 5,000 people in Mendham Township. Then inside the horseshoe, there's Mendham Borough. There's 5,000 people in Mendham Borough. Mendham Borough has their own police force and their own fire department. Mendham Township has their own police force, their own fire department. In fact, I live in a section of Mendham Township where I'm actually closer to the Mendham Borough Police Department than I am to the Mendham Township Police Department. But before I was governor and had the troopers with me all the time, if I had a problem up at my house and I called the police department, the borough police could get there about two minutes faster than the township police. But you know what? They're not coming because they're the borough, not the township. We have two libraries in our towns. We have the Mendham Township Library and the Mendham Borough Library. They're both falling apart. They both want new libraries. Now let me ask you a question. Like, does K-12 
catcher in the rye read differently if you get it out of the borough library than the township library? Couldn't we have just one library that have all those books and DVDs and all the rest of that stuff? But no, you know this. We've been trying to get them to agree to build one library. They won't agree. The township people want their library. The borough people want their library. The township needs a new police headquarters. The borough has a really nice police headquarters. How bad you both get together? How about you keep all the cars in the same parking lot? You all put on the same uniform, carry the same gun, and you go out and protect the enormous number of people, 10,000 people in this area. Tomorrow I'd go for that deal, and I bet she would too. But you know who doesn't go for the deal? The mayors. Because there can only be one if there's one town. Now there's two, then there'll only be one. How awful would that be? It's crazy. And I've been fighting about this for the last five years. I've been trying to get a bill that would help to consolidate municipalities and share services through the legislature. We got a pretty good one, not a great one, but a pretty good one through the Senate. We can't get it through the Assembly. We can't get it through the Assembly. You know why? We've got a bunch of dual office holders in the Assembly, first off. Who else happen to be mayors and local office holders? And like, oh, hey, that would take away that salary I get down there. Because, you know, New Jersey is the best, right, when it comes to public sector work. If you can have one job in the government, why not have two? or three, and we allow you to do that. In fact, we allow you to have more than one elected office. We got people who are mayors and assembly people, mayors and state senators. We got folks who work for the school board and, and they get elected to the legislature and they get salaries from all those people. Each individual job gets a different salary. It's crazy. And the fact is, it's time for us to consolidate that. And I've been arguing that for a while. I'm gonna to continue to argue that's the only thing that's gonna deal with the taxes that you're mentioning, which are the property taxes, which are the biggest problem. On the uh, on the whole running for president thing, we'll see. I'm not sure. Um, I don't have to make a decision now and I'm not going to. Um, I love my job. I love doing the job I have here. I love living here. I've lived here all my life. Um, uh, in fact, we were on vacation a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we took me, Mary Pat, and all four kids to California for nine days and we drove together from San Diego to San Francisco. Here's the good news, we're all still alive. We did not kill each other in the car, the six of us in the same car for nine days driving from San Diego to San Francisco. But one of the places that we went when we were in California was the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. I'd been there once before to give a speech and then so I thought the kids should see this place and it's a beautiful place. It's set up in the mountains in, in Simi Valley, California. And, um, President Reagan is buried there. It's, a, it's an incredible museum and library. And so I took the kids there and we were walking through um, the museum. And I heard my youngest, Bridget, who's 11, was walking behind me with Mary Pat. And I heard Bridget say, oh no, this place is gonna make him run for president. <laughs> and Mary Pat said to her, and they're both like whispering, thinking I couldn't hear. It was really good, so I kept slowing down a little bit, you know, trying to hear, get my father ears up. And, and Mary Pat said, well, why do you think this would make dad run for president? And she said, who wouldn't want a place like this? <laughs> um, and Mary Pat said, well, if dad decided to run for president, why would that be so bad? And she said, because we'd have to move. And I'd have to leave my school and my friends. And I don't want to do that. People don't understand when you think about, and believe me, this is kind of foreign to me. I can't believe that I actually have the ability to make a choice like this. But people don't understand, like, these decisions are not just about could you win or could you lose, or would you like the job or not if you got it. Your family is unbelievably affected by this. Their lives will never be the same. And so we're thinking about it. We'll decide. We kind of like where we are now. I love this job. <laughs> and, and, um, and, you know, if I think it's good for me, it's good for my family, it's good for our state and for the country, then I'll probably do it. But if I don't think it's good for all four, then I won't. And that's the way you make that decision. You don't make that decision based on politics. Because if you do, and you try to predict politics in this in this country, you're wasting your time because it changes on a dime in a minute. Believe me, I've felt that every once in a while. <laughs> all right, other questions? Yes, ma'am, right up here. Thank you, sir, for your question. Hello, Governor. Hi. Mary Jane Manners. I'm from Long Branch. I don't have a question, I just want to thank you for your years of service here in our state. I've seen you many times, I appreciate watching you, 
And if you do decide to run for president and you have our backing, we would love to see you thank in the White House. Really nice. you. Well, I, you know, I appreciate that and I thank you. I mean, think about this. I, my, um, like I said, I was born here and raised here, except for the four years that I spent at the University of Delaware, where I met Mary Pat. I've been in New Jersey my whole life, and I dragged her back here from there. She's from Pennsylvania. And, um, and my, my mom, um, who passed away 10 years ago, uh, so she never got to see this circus my life has become, uh, but she would have really enjoyed watching this. Um, I know she is. I would have liked to see her uh, while this was all going on. She would have had some interesting reactions. Um, my mom, you know, uh, lost her dad very, at a very young age. She had two young siblings. My grandmother had to go to work to support the family um, when she was not even quite a teenager yet. And so she had to work to help support the family. She, she barely graduated high school. She never had the chance to go to college. Um, my dad um, lost his father um, when he was 17 years old. And so he went off and he, he joined the army. And um, when he came back from the army, uh, he went to work at the Briars ice cream plant in Newark. And um, he was working on the, the assembly line at the Briars ice cream plant, a young guy in his early 20s. And the guy next to him was significantly older. And he said, so, so what do you do with your life? And my father was like, well, this is a pretty good job. I get paid well, and they give me medical benefits and, and um, free ice cream. It's like, it's a pretty good job. Um, and he said, no, 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 you, you have to go to college. You're a smart kid, you need to go to college. And my my father said, well, no one in my family's ever gone to college. He goes, well, you served in the military. You have the right to the GI Bill. You should go. You should go to college. And so he kept on my father, thank goodness. I um, never had a chance to meet this guy who, you know, played a role in changing my life and my sibling's life. And he convinced my father finally to, like, work during the day and go to Rutgers, Newark at night. So my father went for six years at night to Rutgers in Newark and got his degree in accounting and wound up being able to have a great profession. Um, for the rest of his life. So the first generation after that, a, a, a first generation guy who went to college at night on the GI Bill and worked at the Briars ice cream plant during the day, and my mom, who helped to support her family, barely graduated from high school and never got a chance to do things like go to college. The next generation, I'm the governor of the state where I was born and raised. It's an amazing honor for me, and, and there's not a day I can tell you that I don't walk into the state house or come to something like this um, and I'm not completely, completely grateful for the chance you give me to do this job. So when you say thank you to me for my service, I appreciate that, and it is a service, and I'm, and I'm, I'm very appreciative that you acknowledge it. But I have to tell you, I thank all of you. Well, thank you. I'm proud to be from New Jersey too. We should all feel proud to be from here. It's a pretty good place, and you know, the fact is, when I travel around the country now, man, everybody's so curious about us. They don't quite know what to make of us. You know, they, they're they really curious about New Jersey and about the people who are here. And we got a lot of colorful characters that come from here, I guess myself included. And we have all kinds of people who make a difference in the world that come from here. And so we should be proud to be from here. And we have problems we have to deal with, yeah, but you know what, that's our job. And my job every day is to try to identify those problems and do the best I can to fix them. And you've now given me two chances to do that. That's an extraordinary honor. And no matter what happens in my life from here, whether I run for a higher office or I don't, um, the eight years that I will have as governor of New Jersey will just be an extraordinary, extraordinary memory for me. And so thank you for thanking me. And I thank you all right back. Because without your support, I wouldn't be there. So lots of questions. All the way in the back. Um, I'm wondering if you're aware that um, they were playing, I think it was like six or seven Bruce Springsteen songs before you got here. <laughs> uh, I, but I was under the impression, I thought I heard that Bruce asked that none of his music was played at your events because he didn't believe in your politics. No, never How it did hurt that. the uh, poor people and the uh, middle class people of the state. No, you're wrong about that. Bruce has never I, asked me to. Bruce has never asked me to do that, and he never has. No, you're wrong. In fact, I saw Bruce just a week and a half ago. Um, you were dancing with Bon Jovi, maybe, in the Hamptons? Well, no, that's that I was doing oh, this sure. weekend. And I wasn't dancing with Bon Jovi. Actually, I was dancing with Jamie Foxx. Um, uh, so, if, so if you're going to be cute, we should get the story right. Um, I saw Bruce about a week and a half ago, um, and he had every opportunity to tell me not to. He didn't. He never has told me not to I'm do it. I'm pretty sure that uh, I... You're, listen, I, I know him, and I know him, and you're wrong. And I understand you're, you're now expressing your politics. My neighbor. 
you're you're now expressing your politics and your objection, and that's fine. Don't put it in Mr. Springsteen's mouth. Put it in yours. If you have an objection to it, then you object. You have every right to object to it. But don't put it in Bruce's mouth, because I know Bruce, and I've spoken to Bruce, and you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. And maybe, guys, um, just when I leave, just so we can have this lady be a little calmer, um, let's play Bon Jovi on the way out. So she a little calmer, because... Because I didn't dance Bonnie with him. I didn't dance alive. with him. I didn't dance Bonnie with him. Dead or alive. Well, you see, that's the kind of positive, upbeat stuff that folks like you bring to these meetings and this debate all the time. And you know what? I'm more than happy to have folks like you absolutely alive. Speak your mind. Be uh, angry or not. It doesn't matter to me. I have a job to do. And I'm going to do my job the best way I know how to do it. And if you object to it, that's okay. That's your right. Any questions? But, but by the way, no, no, no. I, I think no, no, I've no. heard. I think I've heard pretty much what you have to say. I think we got the idea. You know, when you start off, when you seriously, when you start off by mischaracterizing no, I'm something, pretty, I, I didn't make I'm it up. sure I you're pretty sure. That that's what and you've got heard. no place else to go with this story except to stick with the story you've got. How about the but story when I was, about the disabled? But, but when I was standing there, that, that, that guess, you're bringing home if you, if you from wanna, your home. If you want to debate. Run for governor, and then I'll debate you. you. But I'm not debating you now. Your Next daughter question. Did not yes, sir, right there. And you're making these. Hi there. I'm hey, how are you? Adam Schneider, not the mayor. He's over there. I know the mayor quite well. And I do 185 days in Long Branch and 180 in Livingston. So <laughs> yeah, you're not getting any help then. So I believe on your desk is a bill for family reform around the alimony, alimony reform yes there is and there's a lot of support for it where yep. i come from and we're hoping that you might choose to support that as well any yes thoughts? um i'm not going to give any hints about what i'm going to do but what i will tell you is that i've been waiting for four and a half years for them to come up with some kind of compromise and so um i've been examining the bill really closely there's a lot of complicated parts to it and there's people who have opinions on both sides of it i'll be making that decision probably in the next week or ten days um, but I will tell you that what I've been doing for the last four and a half years on alimony issues, and it's probably the second or third biggest issue that I hear about at these meetings, um, by, by both men and women who are unhappy with the system the way it is now. Um, I think that the bill in front of me is an improvement on the current system. The question is, is it enough of an improvement? And so that's the decision I'm trying to make right now. I can see that it's an improvement. I want to decide in my own mind, is it enough of an improvement or can I make it a little bit better and send it back to the legislature? So that's the decision I'm trying to make. I'll make that decision in the next seven to 10 days. And, and you all know then, if I knew now, I'd tell you, but I haven't made up my mind yet. But I am encouraged by the fact that finally, after four and a half years, they did come to some type of compromise agreement, which I think makes the system better. Well, we thank you for your support and glad to be part of the conversation. Thank you, I appreciate thank you being here. And by the way, you know, I grew up in Livingston, so I spent 180 days there. You know, we got a whole bunch of fellow Lancers around here, yes. Thank you for your support for the shore. Because gosh knows we need it. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, too. Yes, ma'am, right back there. He's coming right behind me. Thank you. I'm Leah Kelly, and I live in Monmouth Beach. Yeah. And my question is two parts. Uh, what is your projection for the success of the Newark Public Schools? Okay, you got a second one, too? Secondly, uh, who is overseeing Pammy Anderson? Okay. Because when I was an administrator in Newark, I had people coming, and we were uh, being... Uh, check to see that we were doing our job and so yep. Thank you. We, we have, um, there's two people who oversee, there are two sets of people who oversee Cam Anderson. So we'll start with that one and the next one. Um, uh, the Commissioner of Education, David Hespy, is her direct boss. And we also have an audit team that goes to Newark on a regular basis to audit both on the quality of the educational changes that are being made and audit on the money that's being spent. So it's two different sets of folks, but they all come from the State Department of Education. Um, and finally, um, many of most of what she has to do also has to be approved by the State Board of Education. Um, secondly, on my projection on the success there, um, we've had some pretty good success in the last couple of years in improving. Um, graduation rates have gone up about 9% in the last two years. Um, they have been on decline for many years before this. Uh, we've also seen an increase in grade level reading uh, by about a grade level and a half in Newark, which is good progress, not nearly as good as we need to get to, but we're making progress. Um, it's a very tough job, as you know, 
Um, the, the school system in Newark is difficult not only because of a number of different socioeconomic issues and historical issues, but also because it's getting smaller. And as it gets smaller, you need to downsize the district. And whenever you have to downsize the district, it's controversial. Because that means you have to lay people off. And, and so Cam is going through all of those really difficult things right now. Um, I think on balance, she's done a very good job. Uh, we've had a number of different school superintendents appointed by the state over the course of the last 20 years or so. And it seems to me like every five years, they want to kick the superintendent out. Superintendent gets a five-year contract, at the end of the five years, like, get rid of him or get rid of her. Um, I decided to keep Cam. She did five years, uh, four years rather, she's in her fifth. Um, I extended her contract another three years. Uh, and I believe she's making improvements. Is she perfect? No, but nobody is. Um, I think what you're gonna see for her over the course of the next three years is more listening um, to a lot of the folks in the city of Newark about what they're concerned about. But also in the end, someone's gotta make decisions. Someone's gotta make decisions. And she's making them with, in consultation with the Commissioner of Education. And I think things are getting better, but they're not nearly, nearly what they need to be. And we are still spending an exorbitant amount of money. Um, I am sending through the state budget this year, just to the school system in Newark, $1 billion. And it's just obscene. Now, I would not spend, send nearly that much, except I'm ordered by the New Jersey Supreme Court to spend that much. And when I tried to cut that back three years ago or four years ago, uh, four years ago, uh, in 2010, uh, I got ordered by the Supreme Court to put it back. Uh, you know, it, um, oh no, listen, Mark, you talking about the Mark Zuckerberg money? Well, it was a lot more than that. Um, Mark Zuckerberg contributed a hundred million dollars to the Newark school system and, and it was a challenge grant. So we had to raise through private funds a hundred million dollars to match it. Um, we know exactly where that money is. And by the way, so does Mark. And nowhere near even half of it has been spent yet. Um, and so uh, Mark keeps an eye on his money pretty closely. Um, and he put together a, a group to oversee it along with the state. And we've used it in order to help some teachers who wanted to retire early to move on and pay for some of that. We've also used some of the money for merit pay for teachers who are there now, because we have an agreement now with NERC teachers to be able to pay merit pay to certain teachers. So. Some of that money has been used for that and then for the other four, some early payouts for folks. Uh, but still well over half of that money is still in the bank. Um, and and uh, Mark keeps a pretty close eye on his money. So, But you know, it's, it's one of those things, again, remember, this is a guy who grew up on Long Island, who went to Harvard, and who left Harvard to start Facebook and lives in Palo Alto, California. And he picked New Jersey to invest in with the single largest investment of his philanthropy and he and his wife. Um, since the beginning of Facebook because he believes that the reforms that we're trying to put into effect in Newark are worth investing in. So hopefully he'll still think that way a few years from now. We hope so. Your fingers crossed. Thank you for your question though. Yes, the young guy right there. Um, with uh, events in Ferguson, Missouri going on, um, a lot of people have been um, kind of criticizing the militarization of police. Um, last week, it was announced that Eatontown was getting uh, acquiring uh, military vehicles um, for the police department. And I was just like curious if um, there's anything that you can comment on about um, whether you think it's a good idea that um, local police towns in New Jersey are doing basically what um, you know the Missouri um, police force does, you know, what the militarization is doing, basically. Yeah. Listen, I think that um, I think you have to divide the two things. Okay. None of us quite know yet exactly what happened in Ferguson and what happened to this young man who was killed. And I spent seven years in law enforcement as the chief federal prosecutor in this state. And what I learned during that period of time, among other things, was that what you read in the newspapers and what you see on TV is almost always just a fraction of the story. And so I've been urging people to not prejudge anything here to allow, we have a really good justice system in this country. Is it perfect? No, but it's really good. And in fact, there's no better justice system in the world than the justice system we have in dealing with folks who are accused of crimes in this country. And so first I'd say, you know, let's give the justice system an opportunity to play itself out before we make any kind of broad judgments. Secondly, I'm really concerned about the generalizations that we're then making about police officers. 
But the fact is that the overwhelming majority of police officers in this country are hardworking men and women who put their lives on the line every day to protect us from bad people, violent people, people who mean ill to us. And, and so when something like this happens, like it's happened in Ferguson, people already jump to the conclusions not only about what happened in Ferguson, but also about how does that apply to every other police force across the country. There'll be plenty of time for us to examine this and to learn lessons from Ferguson as all the facts come out. Not just when the TV anchor people are sitting there in Ferguson making you know, a spectacle of this, but when the prosecutors and the investigators, both from the federal government and from the local authorities, do a complete investigation. And I'm confident that they, if there's someone who needs to be charged with a crime here, or more than one person, they will be. And if they're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, they'll be convicted by a jury of their peers and they'll be sent to jail by a judge. And if that's what's appropriate, that's what should be done. But I just don't believe we should be drawing any generalizations or conclusions yet from what we know after just about 10 days of this. We're gonna learn a lot more over the period of time that's gonna come. And then I think we should have an intelligent conversation about whether anything that happened out there is something that we need to learn from and apply here in New Jersey. But until we know all the facts, Politicians who jump out now and public figures who jump out now and start saying a lot of things, they're just trying to get their name in the newspaper. And um, I don't think that's the way you should do it. So I'd be reluctant to say anything more than that just because I know I don't know enough. Um, I say all the time when I was the U.S. attorney privately to our staff, like I hear a politician make some comment about a case they thought we were working on or whatever. And I'd say, you know, I hate when these guys who don't know anything act like they know everything. Now that I'm in public office, I don't want to be guilty of the same thing I used to criticize them for. So until I know more, I think I'm going to give the police the benefit of the doubt here in New Jersey. And as for Missouri, let's let those guys work it out and then let's learn whatever lessons we need to learn from, from what happened when we get all the facts. Last thing we should say is this, no matter what happened, those parents have to be in our prayers. They lost their son. And no matter what the circumstances were of the death of a child, I can tell you as a parent, it is unthinkable, unthinkable that one of your children would die before you. And the sorrow and the pain that his parents must feel right now is indescribable. So one of the things that I've been doing and I hope everybody else does is if you take a moment um, to reflect, if you take a moment to pray, think about those parents because I'm sure that their lives right now are just absolutely in tatters. And I wonder how you put one foot in front of the other every day after you get a phone call like that, learning that your one of your children is, is, is passed away. So I think about that too, I think we all should. Thanks. Yes, sir. Please come behind me. Um, sure. Sorry, my name is Elias, I'm from Eaton Town. I'm a first year law student. So um, my question for you is, well, first of all, echoing this lady over here, thank you so much. I was just abroad for the past year in England and people are speaking very highly of you. So congratulations. Good. Got the British vote, I'm psyched. Great. Um, my question for you is kind of theoretical, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, we're talking about um, pensions. You're on this no pay, no gain tour. Just very simply, there have been a few papers out from scholars discussing the, the possibility of privatizing a pension system. And I was kind of wondering, do you think that that's a viable option down the road in the long run? Do you think that would solve the problems or do you think it would make it worse? I don't know the answer to that question. It's a really good question. And it's certainly um, you know, something that's been considered in other places. Uh, I, I'd be concerned about that only to the extent that I think that if you were to go away from the public part of the pension, it would have to be controlled by the unions themselves. I think those folks would have to have the security of knowing that they were in control if it became private. I don't think it would be appropriate to just farm it out to somebody else because I think they'd feel a real sense of, of, of worry and concern about who's then going to be accountable um, for their retirement. And so I'd be concerned a little bit about that. You know. I have this group looking at it, and I told them nothing's off the table. Suggest anything that you think makes sense. They might come back with a suggestion, something like that. But I just give you my first um, blush reaction to it, which is if you were to do something like that, and I'm not suggesting we would, but if you did, the unions would have to be the people in control of that because I think otherwise they would feel very, very threatened 
by what might happen to their retirement money, where if they were in control of their own retirement money, that might make them feel a little bit more secure about it. Sure. All right, we'll go all the way in the back. Two hands up. Governor Christie, I'm Cheryl Curtis up in East Rutherford. We came down here for wow. my sweetie's very unoften half day off here. Excellent. I wanted to thank you because since before you became governor, we had a chance to speak briefly at an event years back. And over the years, you and your offices, specifically under Hal Wirtz, have been very supportive of the work that I do in my volunteer life, which, as my sweetie knows, is a lot of time devoted to supporting our veterans and their families here in New Jersey. Specifically, the work that is done to get them jobs, help them with the transition, and in particular for the upcoming third annual stand down for the homeless veterans. Yep. And I wanna thank you very much because you have always sent somebody from the office to be with us no matter what we have going on so that there's some representation to show that you definitely stand behind what we're doing. It makes everybody who volunteers feel that what we're doing is not falling on deaf ears, and the cooperation that we receive from Halwart's office and Brian Murray has been phenomenal. And we are very, very appreciative of that. In addition, I know that uh, your schedule did not per allow you to be with us for a special event next month, which relates to the Rehabilitation Act 503, Section 503 compliance which is about hiring veterans yep. and persons with disabilities. Yet I understand that you are taking a look at the Lieutenant Governor being with us, and I thank she you again be. for that. She will be. Because uh, it means so much for the employers to know that you've got their back on that. We really feel it and really appreciate all you've done. Thank you so thanks. much. Well, Kim will be there, thank you. Um, Kim will be there, and um, we've done a, a lot of things, as you know, for veterans, and, I, and we don't brag about it a lot. It's, it's one of the things that we don't talk a lot about because I just think it's an obligation we have. I don't think we should be taking any bows for the fact that men and women who put their lives on the line for us every day in the military and then come home deserve us to treat them in a way that respects their service. And so, for instance, when we were closing the Hagedorn Psychiatric Hospital um, up in uh, Warren County, instead of just closing it and mothballing it, we created a veterans haven north like the one we have in the South. So when there are homeless vets who fall in these really difficult times, they have a place to go. And what we did was because we had a drug and alcohol rehabilitation private facility that was on that campus, we made an agreement with them for them to provide um, to any homeless vet who needed it, a uh, drug and alcohol rehabilitation treatment. Um, you know, we did the, Harm the Helmets to Hard Hat program, which you know about which is for those vets who come back and want to be in the building trades. We made agreements with all the local unions to give preferences to, to veterans who come back and give them a special um, type of training program that's just for veterans and acknowledges the skills that a veteran comes with. I signed about four pieces of legislation to stop the kind of ignorance that we have about the skills that veterans come home with. For instance, you have a veteran who drives a commercial vehicle in Iraq or Afghanistan. They come back home to New Jersey and they want to get their CDL license, their commercial driver's license, to drive a truck here to New Jersey. We make them go through the testing. They've been driving trucks in Iraq and Afghanistan, avoiding roadside bombs, and we're saying, hey, by the way, you need to go through the, the, the program here. We've waived that. Um, nurses who have worked in military hospitals um, as members of the military across the world, they come to New Jersey, we're not making them wait for their licensure or to sit for another test in New Jersey. I signed the bill that says, you perform those services for our military men and women, you can do it here. We did the same thing with the spouses of military members who are teachers, who are nurses, who are massage therapists, any of them that need to be licensed. If you're the spouse of a military veteran and you've been transferred here to New Jersey, to serve the country and your spouse has been transferred, well then we're gonna honor your license from another state. We don't need the spouse of a military veteran to be going through the hassle that they have to go through when they've already been licensed in another state. So we're doing a lot of different things to try to ease at least some of the, on one side, some of the petty aggravations that we all know can make a real difference in our lives and also to give them real opportunities. Um, one of the biggest corporations in the world, Prudential, is headquartered here in New Jersey. And the CEO there has been a leader in trying to encourage other 
companies. Johnson & Johnson has now joined. Their CEO is a veteran um, with creating careers for veterans and internship programs for veterans when they come home in those companies that lead to full-time jobs in those companies. So we're not just talking about the building trades. We're also talking about other types of jobs in corporations like J&J &J and Prudential. And they're recruiting other companies to do it as well. Um, and lastly, I think the crisis that we've seen at the VA hospitals over the course of the last six months or so is leading now to um, our government finally getting smart about this and saying if someone's waiting more than four weeks for mental health treatment at a VA hospital, then they can take a voucher and take it to a local hospital here in New Jersey and get that treatment. We have too many veterans who are committing suicide. And they're doing so not only because of the stress of what happened to them in combat, but also because they come home and they have to wait months to get treatment at a VA hospital for their mental health issues. So this crisis has led to some good things, I think, that will happen for veterans, I hope, in the future. And our hospitals, our health care providers in New Jersey are going to be ready to step in and help those veterans when they come home they have PTSD or drug or alcohol abuse issues um, or other mental health issues to make sure that they get the treatment they need early so that we don't have the kind of tragedies that we're having much too regularly with veterans taking their own lives uh, because that's just just unacceptable. So thanks for the volunteer work that you're doing. We're trying to work hard too hard. All right. It's a beautiful day out. I can take two more questions. I don't have any sunscreen on. So we don't want me out here for too long, Brian. Yes, sir. He's coming behind. Thank you, Governor, for being here. My name is Robert Desmond. I reside here in Long Branch, New Jersey. I would just like to get a generalized question answered from you based on the laws that have been passed back in October of 2009 to try and strengthen those people that are involved in workers' compensation cases where sometimes the respondent is also represented by a self-insured company where their powers are a little bit greater. And what I'm wondering, based on those laws that were passed in 10 of, uh, 2009, can you re respond to how you're seeing whether there are more complaints, whether the claims have gone down, have claims been settled? Because I know there were people that were waiting for claims that didn't settle for five to 10 years, and some of those people are no longer here. My understanding is that since that time, there's been a reduction in the number of claims, um, but I don't think a significant reduction in the number of claims. And it's one of the things that the legislature has been talking about, but I haven't gotten a bill from them yet on further reforms to the workers' compensation system. But it's something that both they've been talking about both in the Senate and in the Assembly. Um, we've tried to help by appointing more workers' compensation judges um, and to keep them fully staffed. Uh, they're a part of the of the executive branch of government, and so through the Department of Labor. So we're trying to get them um, keep up with the pace of getting them fully staffed, uh, because that helps to move the case along too. If you have more judges, but I think what you'll probably see in the next between now and next June is you'll probably see another attempt at workers' compensation reform to try to streamline it more and make the process move a little more quickly. Um, I've heard a lot of conversation about it. I haven't seen a bill yet. And when it comes to me, I'll definitely consider it. And as long as it's not going to be something that's going to hurt the solvency of the fund, then I'll, I'll try to work with the legislature to get something done on that. So I think we have seen a reduction, but not nearly as much as they would have thought when they passed what they did in the fall of 09 before I got there. Thank you. All right. So last question. Let's see. Hey. we got a guy waving up here. So we'll go to the waving guy. Sorry. I saw this waving guy before that. Go waving on guy. With it. There you go, man. What do you got? He's got the microphone right there for you. I'm from Long Branch, New Jersey. Yes, ma'am. And I have a question in reference to the service dogs for the disabled students in the New Jersey schools. Is there anything being done so that these kids can go to school with their service dogs? Because some of the schools don't want them. I know schools don't want them, but I don't think they're permitted to prohibit them. Well, let me check on that for you. If, if you'll get the... We'll get some information from you about how we can get in touch with you. My understanding is that we're not allowed to prohibit them if there's a demonstrated need by a child for a service dog in the school. Um, so let me check on that. We'll get your information. I'll get back to you and let you know whether I'm right or wrong on that. I think I'm right, but I'm not 100% sure. So we'll get back to you on that and let you know. And if there is some way that there's prohibition being done, I'll look into it with the Commissioner of Education about why that is, but I don't believe that they're, that they're permitted to prohibit them as long as they have the appropriate 
uh, proof that it's an absolutely necessary thing for the child to be able to function effectively in the school. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was pretty quick, so I'll get to the other way, the guy down here. He's coming to get you. Welcome, welcome. Thank uh, you. Governor. You mind standing one up there? It'll go with things. I had a, a bad uh, parachute fall a couple weeks ago, so uh, I'm well, a little clearer. If you have a bad parachute fall and all you have is a sling, that's pretty good. <laughs> I consider you lucky then. Yeah. If you're a bad parachute fall, I'm thinking. <laughs> I guess that's what it is, because I'm up here swinging. All right, what do you got? Anyway, Governor, I met you about eight years ago there at a uh, high school in uh, wow. Middletown. Eight years ago? Yeah. I was really young then. <laughs> in East County, 17 schools. Okay. Anyway, you're here in Long Branch, the New Jersey city of injustice. Uh -oh. The chief of eminent domain abuse. And uh, like I said, this deck that you stack up uh, stand upon yes. was donated by, by a fella that you put in prison some time ago. Really? Who was that? Very applied developers. Yeah, I did put him yes, in jail. Yes, yeah. he did. He also donated that. Yep. You know, along... It doesn't with, make them all bad, I guess. <laughs> and it's nice because you take... You don't... Uh, people don't pronounce what you have done. And you, you have my vote all the time. Thank you. And you will continue along a lot of other people. So if you don't mind me, a little history and then my one question. Okay. Oh, you put away like the Long Branch City Council President, Dad Zambrano, and his brother, the I mayor of West Long Branch. I did. Oh, yeah, you did a lot of nice things there. You're going to see the history of all the people I threw in jail. All right. Right. And that is to, uh, to, to keep eminent domain uh, I know what you're saying. Okay. Listen, but, you, how, about, how, anyway, about I su how about I summarize it for you? Because yeah. because I really don't have sunscreen on. Um, <laughs> I understand you are you are both a uh, subject of and an not opponent alone. of. Not alone. My no, I'm sure not alone. I know there was eminent domain used here um, in Long Branch. And, and, uh, and I remember reading all about it and then going up to the Supreme Court at least once, maybe twice. Um, I was a private practice lawyer at the time when all that started. So I was reading that stuff. Um, listen, I think eminent domain should be used very, very carefully. Let me give you an example. Um, we're trying to build dunes now um, on, on the entire coastline of New Jersey. And you can imagine that there are some people who are opposed to that uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Most of the ones that are left who are opposed to it are the ones who say it blocks my view. Um, all of you are here after Sandy. If you don't have a house, you don't have a view. And if your neighbors don't have a house, they don't have a view either. And so I think eminent domain should be used very, very carefully and very, very sparingly. But when the public interest needs to be served by it, as in the case where I'm gonna use it in some selected towns um, to build protective dune systems that will make sure that we protect the homeowners and the property owners, business and personal, um, on the Jersey Shore, from Cape May all the way up to the Bay Shore, I think that's an important way to use it and the way that it should be used. And I have folks who complain about that, and I had someone come to me the other day and say, Governor, would you please reconsider? And I said, no, I won't reconsider. And she said, well, would you at least listen to the argument? And I said, I've been listening to the argument for 20 months now. I'm done listening to the argument. I've made the decision. We're building these dunes. And we're doing it because I never, ever want to see again what I saw on October 29, 2012. Bravo. So I understand your concern about it, um, and, and I do think there are times when it's used when it shouldn't be. And I do believe that we have to have a vigorous court system that allows people to contest those things um, and to put the government to their proofs about whether what they're doing is really necessary and is appropriate under the statutes that have been passed. Um, and, and every one of these cases is unique and different that we've got to consider on the set of facts that it has. Um, but I will tell you that I'm not going to hesitate in places like Margate and Bayhead and Point Pleasant Beach and other places that are complaining right now to do it because I am not going to permit once again to happen in this state what happened Here. Um, on Sandy. We're just not going to permit that to happen. And we can prevent it. And if you look at the towns up and down the shore that had dune systems, 
the damage was significantly less than the ones who did not. If you want to look, there's a whole bunch of different examples, but if you went to just Seaside Park and Seaside Heights, Seaside Park that had a pretty vigorous dune system, and you looked at what happened to the homes there versus Seaside Heights, which had nothing, and the destruction that happened in Seaside Heights was extraordinary. And you could pick out different towns all up and down the coast, the ones that had them and the ones that didn't. By the time we get to the summer of 2016, I believe we'll have dune systems that cover the entire New Jersey coastline, and it will wind up protecting us, saving us money, saving lives, and saving property over the course of the next bit of history of the state of New Jersey. I would have never, ever wanted to go through what we went through, but we need to learn from what we went through. And one of the things I think we've learned is we've got to take whatever actions we need to make sure that we protect the homeowners, the business owners, and the people you know, who, um, who live along our coastline. Um, let me end with this. Um, first, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you for your questions. I appreciate that too. Thank you for the woman who held up the indict sign throughout the entire uh, program. I appreciate her as well. Um, uh, she's a she, she was a she was a, a deer. Um, and that's the great thing about this state. I had somebody say to me the other day after I went to an event in um, in I did one of these in Belmont, and there were a lot of kind of raucous people there, and we're having a, you know good time at my expense. And and someone got up and said, Governor, I don't understand how you take it. I'm like, that's what I get paid for. Part of your job as governor is to take it. Uh, my wife reminds me all the time, if I ever come home and complain, and I don't usually, but if I ever have a particularly bad day and I come home and complain, she reminds me all the time, Chris, you asked for this twice. You asked for it twice. No one put a gun to your head. Nobody told you you had to do it. You weren't being held hostage. You chose to do this. And so I take it because, heck, that's part of the job. But I also get to do a lot of great things in the job, too, every day. Um, I have school kids, you know, in New Jersey, in the fourth grade, everybody's required to learn about New Jersey. And so seemingly, a couple of times a week in the state statehouse, um, except for in the summer, we have groups of fourth graders coming in who come to visit the state house because this is the year they're learning about New Jersey in school. And so I wind up, when I hear them outside, I come out of my office often and go and talk to them and ask them ask if they have any questions for me. And, you know, you get like three questions invariably from every set of fourth graders. Um, what's your favorite color? <laughs> right? What are your favorite sports teams? And what's your favorite part about being governor? And what I tell them about the favorite part about being governor always is that every day when I get up, I know I have a chance to do something great. I don't do something great every day. I am human, very human. And I don't do something great every day, but I wake up every morning knowing that I got a chance to do something great. That's an amazing job, to wake up every morning knowing you got a chance to do something great. And so I'm thrilled to have the job that I have. I love the opportunity that you all have given me. Um, and I love this place where I was born and raised, where I dragged my wife from Pennsylvania, kicking and screaming, believe me. She wanted to come here 28 years ago. She said, I'm not moving there. Forget it, you can finish law school there and then we're moving. Uh, well, I won. It's 28 years later, she's still here, she's now the first lady of the state and, and I think she loves the state just as much or more than I do now. Um, it's a special place. And, um, you know, I'll say one last thing. Here I am in Long Branch, New Jersey with the Atlantic Ocean right behind me and a group of people who are from here or are visitors here 22 months or so after Hurricane Sandy, I only get one question on Hurricane Sandy. Now, let me just point out to you what I think that means. We're not doing everything perfect in the recovery. And I was in Biloxi, Mississippi last week, which got wiped out in Hurricane Katrina. And I asked the mayor of Biloxi, how long did it take Biloxi to recover from Katrina? And he said, eight years. We're now 22 months into this. And we are so much better off this summer than we were last summer. People's lives are so much getting back to normal. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have more work to do. We do. And I'm not going to be content until every person has their life back to the new normal. But if I'd come here, and I did come here a year ago, I would have gotten mostly questions about Sandy. What that tells me is that things are getting better. 
They're not completely better, but they're getting better. And we're going to continue to work as hard as we can every day to restore our state to as close to where we were before October 29, 2012 as we possibly can. That's my mission. That's the biggest reason I ran for a second term. I couldn't leave that part unfinished. So thank you for contributing to help to that, and thank you for having me here. I appreciate it very much.